House of the Month uh, presentation is where uh, somebody gets to present a deal that they've done to our group. Um, typically it's members, they don't necessarily have to be members, and we're always looking for people who are willing to present house, Houses of the Month to our group. So if you've done a deal, we would love to hear from you. We'll help you put the presentation together. It's great exposure, you get to talk to our group. And um, tonight uh, we have Matt LaFave uh, presenting. Um, so Matt, what, what can I say about Matt? Uh, Matt is a, a local broker, started his own brokerage. Uh, he's an investor, uh, he's my friend. Uh, I always forget who, who bought their first multifamily at a younger age. It was me. Well, uh, I bought two, and you bought one in the same year, so I think I, I think I have one. Uh, yeah, okay. But well, I was younger, so I, I, you know, I bought, I, I invested before he did. <laughs> you know, he's bought way more than I have, but that, we don't, you know, that's fine. We don't, we don't need to talk about that. We'll take Anyways, it outside. Matt is a, uh, he's a very successful dude, and uh, I'm very uh, happy to uh, introduce you to him. So come on up, Matt. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Ryan. Oh, I get this microphone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, hello everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me here tonight. Where should I stand to uh, click the presentation? Are you good? Yeah, that's fine. Yep. All right. Good to see you. So, um, been a little while since I've been up on the stage, so I uh, wanted to share with you all a little bit of a uh, project that we worked on recently. Uh, this is a uh, house that we, uh, this is my, my business partner and I flipped on Maple Avenue in Claremont, New Hampshire. Um, I've seen a lot of great House of the Month presentations here. I've seen some Apartment of the Month presentations here before. Uh, but recently, we haven't had a good House of the Month presentation where the speaker tells you about how much money they lost on the deal. So, spoiler alert, this was not one that I actually made money on. Ooh, there's a fly that was hanging out on me there. Sorry about that. I felt something crawling on my neck. Um, this was a deal that I lost money on instead of made some money. So I wanted to share with you some of the things that I learned along the way here, and uh, I'll take you along for the ride about uh, what it's like actually flipping single family houses in Claremont, New Hampshire. But before I get into that, I just wanted to share a little bit of background about me. So I got my real estate license in 2015. Uh, that was when I was the right young age of 18 years old. And uh, I got into it right out of high school. And actually I was attending these meetings, the New Hampshire RIA meetings, all the way back when I was 16 years old in 2013. A couple of the folks who've been going here for a while can attest to that. So feel free to ask around and check my credentials for it. But it really helped me get my start in the real estate business. I learned so much from hearing about presentations like this, hearing from the wonderful speakers that we've had here, and uh, I just can't say enough good things about New Hampshire Rear because that really is what helped get me going into the uh, real estate business. So I started in 2015. I joined the New Hampshire Rear board the following year. I uh, bought my first investment properties in Concord, two of them in 2019, so that's why I think that my, my account's a little bit better. I just hit my 22nd birthday at that point. I bought a nice two and a four unit multi over there. It was a great deal that we got. Um, in 2021, I started investing with my now business partner under the name Downtown Holdings. Uh, the reason we picked Downtown Holdings as a business name is because our goal was to buy buildings in downtowns and we decided our logo was going to be a brick because we like brick buildings in downtowns. It was super simple. That was why we stuck with that name and that's also why I named my brokerage Downtown Realty because, well, it worked out really well for the branding there. Um, so in 2021, I also started my own brokerage and uh, in 2022, that's when I bought my first property in Claremont, New Hampshire, which I'm sure that anybody who's been here for a little while has heard me talk about exhaustively. And uh, we, we've done a lot of investing there since then, so I figured before I actually jump into talking about this flip here, just a brief as to why it is that I talk, why I invest in Claremont, what I see in that community there. Uh, so this, this next slide here, this was the first building that my business partner and I bought in downtown Claremont. Uh, this is called the Union Block Apartments. It was a 40 unit brick building with six retail spaces and 34 residential apartments. Um, it's fully sprinkler building. Needed a significant amount of work when we bought it, but we paid $58,000 a unit when we purchased this building back in 2022, which is basically unheard of in any other market in New Hampshire. Uh, we did end up investing about $30,000 a unit to fix this place up, uh, but all in for, for any type of brick building for under 100 grand a door is pretty much unheard of in, in this day and age. So we found it to be a great opportunity from a pricing standpoint, and also this is a community that's been reinvesting in itself. When we came to town, the, uh, the downtown had just been completely renovated. Million, millions of dollars had been spent by the city to completely repave the streets, 
turn one of the two-way streets into a one-way to make it more pedestrian friendly, expand the sidewalks, add new infrastructure, add stormwater management infrastructure there, and uh, we just saw a community that was redeveloping and, and primed for growth. So for any of you who have asked me before and have, or who haven't asked me yet and not gotten the answer, this is why we've invested in Claremont. We see it as a rising star in the New Hampshire real estate market, and uh, you know we're going to be keeping buying, keep buying there for a very long time. But now to get into the meat and potatoes of the presentation, I'm going to talk to you about this beautiful little home on Maple Avenue in Claremont. Um, as I realized, I actually didn't have a before picture, so this is the after picture there. It was a little bit more overgrown previously. Uh, this garage was all busted up, the windows were broken, it, it needed some painting there. Uh, but this is the little single family house that we bought in uh, June of 2023. So I'll take you back a little ways and tell you some of the basics about this deal. It's a two bedroom, one and a half bath, single family house with 914 square feet, two car detached garage on 0.21 acre lot. It was built in 1920, had public water, but private septic. Interestingly enough, the sewer line stopped about 100 feet away from the property there. So this was the first house on that street that didn't have, that didn't have public sewer after this. So we had to deal with a leach field. Um, the property went to foreclosure auction on May 18th, and uh, shame on me, I wasn't checking the foreclosure auctions in Claremont, New Hampshire. Had I been, I would have gotten this deal for a much better price, but instead, a wholesaler brought it to me. So on May 19th, I got a phone call from a wholesaler who said, Matt, I have this great deal for you. It's a single family, it's a, it's a great flip opportunity, I think it's probably gonna be worth $250,000 if you clean it up, it doesn't need much work, maybe 15 grand, maybe 10 grand, it's gonna be a great deal. And so, of course, you know, you always take that number with a grain of salt, and we haggled back and forth a little bit, and ultimately, we, we came to terms at $122,000 to purchase this property. Um, turns out, he was buying it for $76,000, so he had a pretty darn good markup for making one phone call there. And uh, now, what this did give me the opportunity to do was take a walk through the property before I fully committed to buying it. I sent my contractor over there, he took a spin through the place and realized that it was in much worse shape than what had been pitched to us over the phone. It needed a lot more work than what we initially expected there, so we were able to retrade a little bit with that wholesaler, and we ultimately brought the price down to $118,000. So he still made a couple bucks on this deal. You know, we shouldn't feel too bad for him in this instance here. Um, and, and he did, his contractor actually ended up taking our appliances from the house for a few days because they were bringing them into storage. But after we realized that they were missing, we quickly got them back into the house and, uh, you know, things worked out okay. I think he was motivated to make sure that deal took place there. So we ended up closing on June 16th, and from our initial numbers on this, we thought that the house would sell for somewhere around two hundred dollars to $230,000 on the back end, and we projected that we needed about $20,000 worth of work here. Now, the one X factor that we had up front is we did have a septic inspection done. Uh, by one of our former vendors here, Septic Check Inspections, we hired them to take a look at the septic system because we knew it was a foreclosed house, it was old, and so we had them take a peek at it. But the downside is there was no water on in the house. So he could only do a limited inspection. He took a peek around in there and said, hey, there's gonna be like a 50-50 chance this thing is failing. You know, it doesn't look good. I don't see anything that's broken or cracked or completely missing right now, but there's a chance that the septic system is failing. So that $20,000 number that we originally estimated, we figure, all right, there's a shot that this might be an extra 10,000, but we're paying 118 grand. We have enough margin here, you know, worst case scenario, we only make $25,000 on this flip instead of $35,000 on this flip. So it'll all come out in the wash. We'll be fine. So I'll show you a couple photos of what this house looked like before. And honestly, it really wasn't in that bad of a condition. You know, this is the kitchen, this is the living room. You can see that there was some trash in there that we had to clean out of the, out of the place. But these cabinets were actually in great shape and ultimately we ended up reusing the cabinets in the kitchen here. Um, so the condition of the, of the house wasn't too bad. You know, there's just a lot of trash in it. It was a foreclosure. They didn't really clean anything up beforehand. So a lot of this was trash out, rip out the floors, do some new painting. It was a super big project there. You know, you can see all the bathroom, all the water was shut off in there because the house had been vacant for about 12 months at that point. Uh, but overall, it didn't look like the worst flip in the world. And so to show you a couple of the after photos from this, you know, there, there was a few things that came up in this, but we were able to salvage all the cabinets in here. We did have to get some new appliances in the door. You know, some of the ones that we had in there really weren't cutting it for us. So we did buy a new appliance package for it there. 
Um, we repurposed some of the countertops and, and saved them there. Um, but you can, you can see we did all new floors, new paint, it's bright, it's clean. It was a pretty low budget flip here. Because one of the things that came up as we went through this renovation is once we actually got the water turned back onto this property, um, this is just some pictures of the living room and bedroom here. Once we got the water turned on back in this property, we found out that two things. One, not all of the copper pipes that were supposed to be in this house were actually in this house anymore. At some point between the time that we put it under contract and the time that it closed, somebody stole the copper out of the house. So we had to do a lot of plumbing work that fortunately it was only the baseboards and the radiators that we had to redo, but we still had to do some extra plumbing work that we didn't plan on. And well, the second thing, and as you can see from this brand spanking new boiler in here, the nice looking boiler that was in the basement wasn't so nice on the inside and the boiler had, was not properly winterized, it froze, it cracked, and what we thought was gonna be a perfectly functional boiler was actually needing complete replacement with no ability to salvage it. So we ended up spending an extra $17,000 more than we, we budgeted for in order to put this brand new uh, on-demand hot water and uh, forced hot water heating system in the house. So our initial budget for this of $20,000 ended up getting ratcheted up about $17,000 after we had to do this additional work in here. So that wasn't fun. The rest of the renovation process wasn't super exciting. We did the rest of the fluff and buff there. We put new floors down, new paint. We refinished the cabinets. We did some uh, the countertop work, replaced the appliances. We cleaned up the outside of the place. Uh, we did some work in the garage, as you saw from the first picture. And overall, it turned out to be a pretty easy flip. So these were a couple of the, pro the, the things that we, we learned here along the renovation process. Uh, one quick tip that I wanna share with you, and uh, this actually worked out really well for us, is we gave our contractor a bonus structure. Basically, we told him upfront, and this is somebody that we've been working with for the past 18 months remodeling apartments for us, is, hey, if you get this project done under the budget that we set, you know, boiler issues and copper pipes issues stolen aside, because that was kind of outside of his control, but if you hit our budget, do everything under what we said, and you do it within 30 days, we're gonna give you a $2,500 bonus. And if we sell it above, I forget what the price was, but we had a price in mind. If we sell it above X price here, we're gonna kick you an extra $2,500 bonus because you did such a good job. So we incentivized him to get this project done in a timely fashion and under budget. And guess what? He did. He did it for just shy of $15,000. I think it was like 1400 or 14 grand to change on there. And uh, he completed the project in 28 days. His crews worked hard. They, they definitely had some long days doing it, but it was done. And we were really pleased that we were able to get this property out there and on the market very shortly thereafter. So that was the renovation process with this house. Now, here was the next fun part that we had to deal with. We decided to list the house a little bit high, and as you know, I'm a real estate broker, so I did list this property for sale myself. We put it up on the market for $259,900, 31 days after we purchased it, which did mean that we were subject to the 90-day FHA seasoning period. And if you don't know about this, if you buy a property and you're trying to resell it within 90 days of the purchase and you're trying to sell it for more than 100% of what you paid for, or I think it's 120% of what you paid for it, this kicks in a rule where as an FHA buyer, you cannot purchase this property. So it really limits your buyer pool here. And as we found out in Claremont, New Hampshire, yes, Gal? If you show, I, if you show the renovation that you did work, sometimes it's working, you have to work with a lender on it? Yeah, a part of our problem is this building went to record at the price the wholesaler paid and not the price that we paid. So we kind of got screwed out of that a little bit there because they paid $76,000 and it looked like we were trying to sell this for three times the price of what we paid for it, when in reality it was a little bit less than that. So we did try and work through that. We had a lot of FHA buyers come through there and every time their lender said no for this. So it did limit our buyer pool a little bit and we were kind of restricted to conventional or cash buyers for this property. Um, we did end up having over 30 showings on the house during this period here, um, and we didn't get any offers for a solid three months on it. The feedback was relatively positive. Oh, it looks like a cute little starter home. Things are good. Um, you know, you know, there was a little couple extra things you could have done to remodel it, but it was just a little too small, or you know, our buyers found something better, and we just could not find a buyer for the life of us. So we ended up aggressively cutting the price, and this is a schedule starting on July 20th, 
going all the way to October 9th, when we ultimately signed the contract on it, of the price cut schedule. 259.9, 249.9, 239.9, 229.9. We're cutting pretty aggressively here. This is the range where we actually expected to sell in. 217.5, 209.9. We went pending briefly with the buyer who didn't even try and renegotiate the price. They just decided they didn't want to buy it anymore after two days being under contract. Kind of screwed up our, our history there. If you look on a property and see it went under contract and back on, you think something's wrong with it. Yeah, these people did that to us. So they didn't even have a problem. They just didn't like it after a while. And so finally, we put it back up for $194,900. And mind you, we're into this now for about 150 grand. So we don't have a huge margin on this property anymore. And so this was sort of our, our really rock bottom price that we were at. We finally found a buyer, signed a contract on October 9th for $194,900. And great, everything's good. Let's celebrate. We signed the contract. All the worst stuff is behind us. They had a short home inspection period, which we were just holding our breath during, hoping that nothing would go wrong. We told them up front that we weren't gonna negotiate on the price, and surprisingly, they listened. They, they did not try and renegotiate on the price. And at this point, we were at $194,000 for this house. All of the single families around us were selling for in the 200 plus range, and we couldn't, we couldn't see anything happening wrong with the appraisal. There was no chance that we were gonna have an issue with the appraisal. Guess what? We did, but, it wasn't a value problem with the appraisal. So this appraiser took it upon himself to pull up the GIS map for where this property was located. And as you know, they put that little disclaimer on there that say GIS, GIS maps are inaccurate, you know, you have to do a survey and blah, blah, blah to verify the accuracy of this data. Well, this is a picture of our property right here. That green blob is the house, and that yellow blob is the garage. Now this house was built in 1920 and the garage was probably 50 years old at this point. And so looking at this map, we figure, well, you look at that there, that property line for that house is really close there. So that's probably wrong. You know, you look at, you look at this one over here, clearly this is wrong over here too. There's no issues. Well, the appraiser looked at this and said, hmm, looks like the garage is over the property line. So we're gonna need you to get a survey done for this property to make sure that that garage is actually on the property. Great, now that's an expensive endeavor. And we had just hired a surveyor for a different project and the turnaround time from them was six weeks to do a six acre piece of land and they were charging us like $25,000 for that survey. So we figured this was gonna be a 10 to $15,000 survey job. And mind you, we were in the middle of November at this point on month five of holding on to this vacant house. So we did not really wanna wait around for a survey to be done. And so we argued back and forth with the lender for a couple days and said, there's no way, this thing has been here for 50 years, it's not a problem. Then I pulled up the deed and I got on Google Maps and did that little measurement tool, which isn't 100% accurate, but it's, it's pretty darn accurate. And I came to the conclusion without hiring a surveyor for $15,000 that that garage was about five feet over the property line. <laughs> And it had been that way for 50 years and transferred at least five times. And guess who was the first person to find that out? Those damn appraisers, that's who. So at this point, we had a few options that we could look at. And now our, our margin's so thin here, we, we were gonna end up making somewhere between seven and $10,000 between the renovation costs, the carrying costs that we had here, I had already agreed to give up my commission as a real estate broker to sell this property for myself here. So I wasn't making any money on the, on the sales side. So we were really tight on what we were gonna be able to do. So here's our options. We could hire an appraiser and, uh, or excuse me, hire a surveyor and contest the appraiser's claim. Chance of success was pretty low. It was gonna take about six weeks and cost us a fortune that we didn't really need to spend. So we ruled that option out immediately. Option two was to file a prescriptive easement. A prescriptive easement is basically saying, this thing has existed in this location for so long that we should have the right to it. And in this case, we said the garage has been here for 40, 50 years. We believe that it's been encroaching on this person's property for 40, 50 years. It's transferred many times. So by right, we should actually own this land because our garage has been there forever and nobody's complained about it. And our attorney that we called up and talked to said, there's a pretty good chance of success for that, but you're gonna have to go to court. And <laughs> that's not a quick process here. That's gonna take you like six or nine months to go. It's only gonna cost you a few thousand dollars for me. Like I'm not gonna charge a lot for it, but 
we were going to get stuck six to nine months holding on to an empty single family house that we couldn't sell. So we thought about that, but ruled that option out too. Option three was tear down the garage and renegotiate the price. Good side on this, it was pretty high chance of success because we were talking to the buyer directly. It was only gonna take us a week or two. Mind you, we were in late November, so we had a pretty limited runway to do this. And I thought it was gonna cost us about $15,000 to demo the garage. Plus, we were gonna to have to compensate this buyer by reducing the purchase price by the fact they don't have a garage anymore. So it was gonna cost us somewhere between twenty-five dollars and $30,000 to do that. And that did not seem like a good option either, but we got really darn close to doing it. Last but not least was call the neighbor who the garage was encroaching on their property and try and work out a deal with them. So after talking with our attorney, there was two different ways we could do this. We could do a lot line adjustment, which would have required us to go to the zoning board, planning board, deal with the city, go through all these meetings, and that was, that was just not happening. That was gonna extend our timeline way too much. So instead, we, we worked out an easement instead where we decided we were gonna call up the neighbor, say, hey, we want to have an easement filed to allow our garage to exist on your property in perpetuity, and we're gonna pay you to allow this easement to happen. The problem was the neighbor had a mortgage on their house. Now, the public records are a beautiful thing. You can look up what somebody pays for a property. You can look up what they took out as a mortgage when they initially bought that property. And fortunately, they only had about a $40,000 mortgage when they bought this house about five years ago. So we figured, all right, well, there's a chance that this person isn't going to have a huge mortgage anymore. We're going to go ahead and just make them a stupid offer that they can't refuse. We're going to call them up. We're going to offer them $20,000, and we're going to tell them, we're going to give you $20,000 towards paying off your mortgage if you let us put an easement for that garage on your property because they're gonna to have to pay off their mortgage. They had a bank like Wells Fargo or something like that. They would never let that happen. So the only option and the only chance was they had enough money in the bank to pay off the rest of their mortgage and they take that $20,000 deal. And so lo and behold, after a phone call to this very understanding neighbor, uh, him and his family talked about it and they very quickly realized that a $20,000 gift horse is not something you should look in the mouth and they agreed to our deal. So we ended up uh, putting together, this, this is a, a quick uh, synopsis of the easement that we had written here. This actual easement work prep and hiring the attorney cost us like 1200 bucks, uh, but paying the neighbor was the extra $20,000 for us that really ate into our profit margin a little bit there. So ultimately, this was the final numbers for the project here. I don't know what happened with the formatting there, that kind of screwed up a little bit. You can't even see the bottom part of it, it escaped. Yeah, it escaped. No more profit. It escaped. So we ended up buying this property for $118,000. Our closing costs on the upfront were about six grand. Uh, we had $38,000 into the renovations between our initial $20,000 budget that we expected, which included our contractor's bonus in there, plus the additional uh, fifteen dollars to $18,000 that we spent on the brand new boiler and plumbing that we didn't account for. Um, I don't know what the rest of it said, but I think we had some cost of sales about six, seven thousand dollars between the closing cost fees, transfer tax, and the broker commission that we had to pay to the buyer's agent because, of course, we were advertising with the buyers, you know, advertising commission to them too. We ended up spending twenty thousand dollars to pay off the neighbor's mortgage. Mind you, they brought like four grand to the closing, and they paid off the rest of it with that four thousand dollar check. So they really, they had their house paid off after this. They were very happy to come to that closing. Our attorney charged us $1,220 for the, for the trouble of doing that. So ultimately, we spent $201,420 or thereabouts in terms of uh, spend on this project, and we sold for $194,900 here, meaning that we lost about $6,500. I, as the real estate broker, didn't get to make my 2% uh, my commission there, so I was even more pissed off about that. But you know what? We gave it up because ultimately, we were just going to be taking the money from one pocket and putting it in another. So this was, uh, this was my first deal that I've really got a good loss on for you. And I figured I would share with you that it is okay that sometimes you can lose money on these projects. Not every single family house is gonna make money. Not every flip that you do is going to work out okay. And sometimes you're gonna lose money on them no matter how hard you try, no matter how big of a margin that you have here. And this might have turned us off from flipping houses for a little while, but I think eventually we'll come back around to doing it. And it speaks nothing against the Claremont market because we're still buying rental properties there like no tomorrow. So. That's about all I got for now. Thank you so much for listening to